Benjamin Most recited 2,522 numbers of pi at the Harvard Days Pi Recital Contest in 2010. How is he doing that? Benjamin is not the only person on earth with super memory. There are many others like him that compete in memory competitions. So how do they do that? To explain how long-term memory works, we must first get a better understanding of how we form memory. This is a basic model of memory. After you receive a stimulus, your brain begins to process that information. To form long-term memory, we convert the short-term memory, also called working memory, to long-term memory via long-term potentiation. Long-term potentiation is a long-lasting strengthening of synapses between nerve cells. I will be explaining what that is in this video and explain the importance of a protein called AMPA receptor, also known as alpha amino 3 hydroxy 5 methyl 4 hydroxyl propionic acid receptor. <laughs> memory is formed in the brain. The main region of the brain that deals with memory is called the hippocampus, shown in the color blue in this picture. The location of long-term potentiation is between two neurons, specifically the synaptic cleft. Glutamate is the major neurotransmitter involved in the long-term potentiation. When action potential travels down the axon of presynaptic neuron, glutamate is released from the axon terminal. So what's picking up the glutamate? There are two receptors involved, the NMDA receptor and AMPA receptor. The orange circles are phospholipids. Please fill the gap with imagination because the manual work of filling every white spot is too time consuming. This is a side view of the dendrite. In the extracellular space, there are glutamates and calcium ions. NMDA receptors are not activated by low levels of glutamate release and are blocked with magnesium ion which prevents the extracellular ions from coming in. AMPA receptors, on the other hand, will readily pick up glutamate and depolarize the cell. This causes the magnesium to be released and allow calcium to influx. The activation of NMDA receptor and influx of calcium not only excite the neuron, it also activates the pathway that allows more AMPA receptors to be inserted. With more AMPA receptors in the dendrite, the dendrite is now more sensitive to glutamate release. This process also increases glutamate release from the axon terminal of the presynaptic neuron. That's a quick summary of long-term potentiation. But how do you know these AMPA receptors actually exist? Using fluorescent microscopy, scientists are able to observe the insertion of AMPA receptors into the membrane of red hippocampal neurons. Enjoy! This is a visual representation of how AMPA receptors look like according to the protein data bank. This ionotropic receptor is 140 angstroms wide and 120 angstroms in length. We can break down the structure in three subunits. The amino terminal domain, ligand binding domain, and transmembrane domain. I will first focus on amino terminal domain. If you look from the top, you can kind of see that it is a dimer with dimers. This is another visual representation of how the protein looks like from the top. From the side, you can clearly see that it is made out of four chains. To clarify before I explain about the structure, we will be looking at the AMPA receptor from the top. AMPA receptors can be heterotetramer, meaning not all subunits are identical. For AMPA receptors, heterotetramers are made out of four polypeptides and must be in this arrangement. This heterotetramer is preposterous and does not exist in nature. AMPA receptors can also be homotetramer, meaning all subunits are identical. So what are these subunits? There are four genes involved. Gluate 1, 2, 3, and 4. This is an example of heterotetramer made of Gluate 2 and Gluate 1. The rules of creating heterotetramers is as follows. Heterotetramers can be made out of Gluate 1 and 2, 3 and 2, finally 4 and 2. That was easy, but what about homotetramer? For homotetramer, the rules are a little different. You don't see homotetramers of Gluate 3 in nature. However, you do see homotetramers of gluate 1, 2, and 4. This concludes the amino terminal domain. Next, the ligand binding domain. 
Glue A subunits have extracellular amino terminus and intracellular C terminus as shown. The ligand binding domain is made up from amino terminal region S1 and S2. This is where glutamate binds. There are four membrane spanning domains, TM1, 2, 3, and 4. This region is called flip-flop region. All amplifier receptor subunits exist as two splice variants. Only a few amino acids change, but the effect is dramatic. Let me explain how amplifier receptors get these variations. For example, let's use GLU-A4 gene. Here we have GLU-A4 gene in the DNA. This green region marks the gene. The red regions show the exons, and the rest are introns. After transcription, pre-mRNA is made with both introns and exons. After splicing, only exons remain. After translation, you have your GLU-A4 polypeptide. I know, this may be confusing, but if you understand this mechanism, you will understand where we get these variations from. Let's go back to the DNA. But this time, you have these two important exons called exon 14 and exon 15. Watch what happens when splicing occurs. If exon 14 remains, it is a flip. If exon 15 remains, it is a flop. So why is this important? I briefly mentioned that amplifier receptors are made out of four genes. Hetero and homo tetramer gives you six variations of amplifier receptors. If we add flip-flop variation, we get 18 variations. That's a lot of variations. Now let's take a closer look at the ligand binding site. There are four glutamates bounded. When glutamate binds to this site, the ligand binding clamshell closes 21 degrees, thus partially opening the channel. This concludes the ligand binding domain. Next, the transmembrane domain. As you see, alpha helixes create a tunnel for ions to go through. This concludes the transmembrane domain. When the nerve cells are overstimulated with glutamate, it damages or kills the cell. This is called excitotoxicity. Examples of excitotoxicity include spinal cord injury, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, and alcoholism. Agonists of AMPA receptors are glutamate, domoic acid, AMPA, and quisqualate. Antagonists include MBQX, ethanol, and tazampanol. Interestingly, AMPA receptor antagonists are anticonvulsants used in patients with epilepsy in the treatment of partial onset seizures. Now you know how Benjamin was able to memorize immense amount of numbers and how AMPA receptors play a big role in memory. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, leave a like and subscribe for more videos every year around this time. Thank you for watching. Using fluorescent microscopy. Using fluorescent microscopy. Using fluorescent microscopy. <laughs> My. Using fluorescent microscopy, this video shows the insertion of AMPA receptors into the membrane. Ah! Congratulations! Good job!